Uh, now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for the night, Michael Weider. Michael Weider. Um, he's going to talk tonight about the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, and how it affects you and your family. And I'll give you a little bit of information about Micah here. He graduated from the University of Michigan Flint campus as a biology in a, with a biology degree in 2000 and went back to earn a business administration degree in 2002. He started his business career at a title insurance company and began working at Security First Benefits in early 2007. Security First Benefits is an independent insurance agency located in Flint and they've been in business since 1924. So it's a reputable firm. Uh, it's been in business for a long time. Uh, Mike has been employed uh, with uh, Security First for nearly seven years and about 95% of his time is spent specializing in healthcare insurance, 75% helping individuals and about 20% of his time helping groups. So without further ado, if you'll put your hands together and welcome Micah to our stage, please. Thank you, Terry. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to come on up here and talk to you guys about this. Um, I know there are a lot of scary topics facing our country right now, and uh, Obamacare is probably one of them on, on the top of most people's lists. It's a very confusing topic. A lot of people have been receiving cancellation notices. What do you do? There's nowhere to turn. There's no answers. So as Terry stated, I am an insurance agent. That is my career, but today is not a sales seminar. Today is an education seminar. I want to let you guys know what we know in the industry, what we are faced with on a daily basis, and what some of my customers are faced with as well. And you guys can feel free to ask me questions at the end, and I guarantee you I won't have all the answers. You may even leave here more confused than you were when you came in, but you will be more educated. This law is very complicated, and I hope to at least shed some light on why it looks the way it looks, okay? Um, I do start out with a general um, disclaimer. This presentation provides a general overview of certain aspects of health care reform based on the information that's currently available. It does not cover all the requirements and new information is released frequently, as we know. This information provided today should not be considered legal advice. It's an educational tool only, and the effect of reform may differ depending on your circumstances. Okay? And as you leave today, I did set up a table. There are a bunch of handouts. Some of you may have grabbed some already. They probably make absolutely zero sense right now, but after the seminar, they may make a little bit more sense to help yourself to anything you see out there that you may want to take home and read or share with a neighbor, friend, or family, okay? We started doing these seminars here probably about two and a half months ago. My friend Howard Myers, I'm um, here in the corner. Howard is a local North Branch um, gentleman who's been in the insurance industry, and he asked me to help him take over his health insurance business because Obamacare was too hard for him to keep up with and we wanted to make sure that his customers were informed. And after doing that for a couple weeks, we realized that there is a need for education on this topic. Um, th there's just so much misinformation that's floating around out there that I want to try to put a, a stop to some of that stuff. So what is the Affordable Care Act? I first of all want to let you guys know that it is health care reform, it is Obamacare, it is PPACA, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, and it is just the ACA, Affordable Care Act. They are all one and the same. I'm sure some of you may have seen a late night show by Jimmy Kimmel, and I think, um, I, I think Bill O'Reilly did it as well. He went out on the street and said, hey, do you like the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare better? And people are like, oh, I like the Affordable Care Act better. They have absolutely no clue that it is the same thing. So if I say Affordable Care Act, PPACA, health care reform, Obamacare, we're talking about the exact same thing, okay? Surveys show that as many as half of Americans think that it's not a law, it has been repealed, or it is going to be repealed. I know that with the Tea Party there's a big push for it to be repealed, and I am in 100% support of that because I live, eat, drink, and sleep this stuff. But it is law of the land as we know now, so what does it mean, right? So go ahead and flip to the next slide, please. So let's get started. What you really need to know is what do the plans look like? How much do they cost? Can you keep your current plan? We already know the president said, you know, if you like your plan, you can keep it, period, right? Just like the cupcakes. But the fact is we know that's not true. When he said that on November 14th, which is a Thursday, it was in direct retaliation to a Tuesday comment made by Bill Clinton and said, I think the president should really make good on this promise. So he came out to the American people and said, I, I apologize. You're not able to keep it. Sorry about that. 
Um, but you know what, I think you should be able to, but it's not my decision. I'm going to have to push that back to the states. So each individual state had to make the determination of whether or not they wanted to allow the continued sale of canceled policies. If the state said yes, then each individual carrier had to say yes or no. Just so you know, in the state of Michigan, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan is about the only carrier that has really mass produced cancellation notices, and those are continuing to stay in place. They are not going to go back and redo everything that they have worked for the last three and a half years to do. On November 14th, you're giving them 46 days to change track. It's not enough time, simply put, okay? Do you qualify for a subsidy? Premium help, plan help, okay? How do you enroll for coverage? What if you don't buy a plan? What is your penalty? Every man, woman, and child is going to pay a tax if they do not buy health insurance. It's the first time we as citizens have paid a tax on something we do not purchase. And there are also new fees and Affordable Care Act taxes that are coming down the pipeline. And I'm going to talk about each one of these bullet points in future slides. So moving on, individual market changes. Some of the things that are really affecting our market right now, just to let you guys know, those of you that are on Medicare, there are really no direct changes to your plan. Those of you that are on large group plans, if your employer has over 50 or over 100 employees, there really are no major changes that are coming down right this second. There may be some changes coming down later on, on the group plans. Um, but the small group and individual market is really what's being tossed and turned right now. These things right here on the individual market changes are really causing a lot of rate disruptors. Okay? First of all, every plan must be categorized under a metal level. They must be platinum, gold, silver, bronze, and there's a new kind of metal called catastrophic. So, those, so when you see plans in your shopping and you see bronze, silver, gold. It was meant to regulate the industry where a Blue Cross, a HAP, and a Health Plus plan are all gold plans, so they're all going to look the same. My customers know that that's not the issue. This was supposed to simplify it, but there are still just as many options and they are still just as confusing, if not more so. Essential health benefits. These are 10 things that every insurance plan must cover. Again, the small group market, they covered most of these things, nine, maybe all 10 of them in most plans. The individual market did not. Maternity coverage, prescription drug coverage, substance abuse and mental health coverage, and pediatric dental and vision are four things that the individual policies really didn't cover a lot. And you can imagine that my 50-year-old single males that don't have any kids having to pay for maternity coverage aren't really too excited about their premiums increasing. The true maximum out of pocket. If you guys are familiar with old plans, you have a deductible, which is something that you're gonna pay for major medical services before the insurance company kicks in. Then you have co-insurance, which is 80-20, typically, somewhere 70-30. After you hit your deductible, the insurance company pays 80%, you pay 20% up until another level. Then you also have co-pays over here, which would be your office visit and prescription drug co-pays. If, if anybody has had the experience of maximizing their plan on their deductible because they had a hospital visit or surgery or some kind of procedure, You've maxed out this part, but if you go to the doctor and you get your prescriptions, you still have co-pays that you have to satisfy. So there's really no cap on those. The true out-of-pocket maximum is changing that. Every dollar out of your pocket goes towards this maximum, okay? And again, we're going to go in a little bit more detail here in future slides. The next three bullet points, guaranteed issue, no pre-existing conditions, and no rating for medical conditions, I call that simplified underwriting. If anybody has gone through the individual insurance process of having to fill out a health questionnaire of every time that you've taken a medication, every doctor's office you've been to, every ailment, it's very daunting, and a lot of you may have been declined or rated up for a medical condition you have. No more of that. Starting January 1st, all plans must accept everybody, no health questions asked, no extra charges. The advanced premium tax credits and reduced cost sharing are two different kinds of subsidies. The first is premium subsidy, so it's going to help you pay for your plan. The reduced cost sharing actually lowers the internal cost within your plan. It lowers your deductibles and your co-pays. And the last thing is the Medicaid expansion here in the state of Michigan. Michigan did pass the Medicaid expansion. They did it kind of at the last minute. It is effective for April 1st, not January 1st. By expanding Medicaid in April 1st, it did create a gap in coverage for those 90 days for those that would be Medicaid eligible. And again, I'll go into detail about that. So going on into each one of these bullet points, let's talk about the metal levels a little bit. When we see a metal level, platinum represents a 90% actuarial value equivalent. Gold is 80, silver is 70, bronze is 60. What does that mean? The federal government has compiled data with what the average American family spends out of their pocket. 
A platinum plan must cover roughly 90% of those costs. Again, your individual situation may be different because you may not be the average American family, but the, the platinum plans were designed to cover 90% of an average American family's out-of-pocket costs. Gold were 80, silver were 70, and bronze is 60. The government gave each plan a plus or minus 2% window. And I really do hate to get this technical with this stuff because I know a lot of you are probably going, man, this is really boring. What does this even mean? But I think it's very important to understand why people are getting cancellation notices. Their current plans don't fit into these metal levels. If a plan fits at 75%, it's not gold, it's not silver. It cannot exist. All plans must fit within these parameters. Okay? The catastrophic plans are available for those under 30 years old or those under an extreme financial hardship. The catastrophic plans, uh, if any of you have college kids that may have the young adult blue plan, the Blue Cross plan, it was a very affordable, about 50 bucks a month here a few years ago for a college kid. Great plan. Those plans are going to the wayside, and these catastrophic plans have taken their place. So moving on to the next one here. Essential health benefits. These are the 10 topics. And again, I do have flyers on all this stuff out here, so if you wanted to know a little bit more about some of this stuff, again, there's an actual essential health benefits flyer out there. Okay. Hospitalization, ambulatory, laboratory services, preventative, rehabilitative services, emergency services, these are things that you're probably used to seeing being covered on a health plan. But again, in the individual market, maternity coverage was scarce, if non-existent at all. A lot of carriers I had didn't even offer maternity coverage. If you did want it, it was a very hefty price. One of my carriers, if you bought maternity coverage, it was about $500 a month in additional premium. You couldn't get pregnant for the first 12 months. So if you do the math and you time it exactly right, you could have that baby for about 21 months, so you're gonna pay $500. Put that money in a bank account and just go pay cash. What is the purpose of a maternity rider when you have to pay that much out of pocket, right? So even the plans that had maternity riders were very lax. All plans must cover maternity the same as any other injury or illness going forward, okay? Same thing with mental health and substance abuse. Some of my plans had it, some plans don't. They all must have it in the future. Prescription drug coverage. I have a lot of people that choose to self-medicate. They may buy generic drugs for $4 at VG's with no prescription drug coverage. They may do homeopathic methods, I mean, whatever they want. But they have to buy prescription drug coverage in the front, or I'm sorry, in the future. So what a lot of my people did was they would carve their prescription drugs out so that they could save money in their premium. Well, they can't do that anymore because it's a mandatory benefit coverage. And the, the pediatric dental and vision. Again, those of you that do not have kids underneath the age of 19 do have to have pediatric dental and vision coverage on your health plan. Now, with that said, most of the carriers have added it onto your health plan at a zero cost. So you have to add the benefit level, but it is free. If you have kids, that's when they add the extra charge on, okay? The true out-of-pocket maximum, the MOOP, we call it, this is what I talked about where your deductibles, your coinsurance, your co-pays. Every dollar that you spend out of pocket goes towards a maximum. The highest level that any plan can be is $6,350 for a single coverage plan and $12,700 for a family coverage plan. They don't have to go to that amount, but that is the maximum. Some of the platinum plans or gold plans may have a $1,500 or a $2,000 true out of pocket maximum whereas most of the silver, bronze, and catastrophic plans have this $6,350 out of pocket. So for those young adults that you want to buy a catastrophic, affordable health plan for, they could still have $6,350 out of pocket. And for somebody with a low income, that's a lot of money. For somebody with a high income, that's a lot of money. My favorite slide is the next one, simplified underwriting. There's a lot of things that make my life not very fun in the insurance business. This makes my, my life a lot easier. The rates are the rates are the rates. Again, I don't care what illness you have. I don't care whether or not you just had coverage. I don't have to play doctor anymore. I don't have to ask you, oh, you have blood pressure medicine, cholesterol medication, okay. That's probably gonna be a 20% rate up, but we don't know until you fill out an application and they come back with us with an offer. Again, the rates are the rates are the rates. Everybody has to be accepted, no health questions asked, no additional premiums charged. The only factors that can be used are how old are you, where do you live, who are you covering, yourself, your spouse, your kids, and do you smoke? 
That's it. There is a three to one pricing ratio that has now been set forth that all insurance companies must follow. And when we talk about things in the law that I do think are going to cause this thing to derail, you know, I, I think there are a few things. But one of the things is this three to one pricing ratio. Insurance companies can now only charge three times the amount for an elderly person. And I, when I say elderly, I'm talking the high end of the 64 range compared to the 21 year old. So I'll use numbers. 21 year old cost $100. A 64 year old could cost no more than $300. Insurance companies have had to shrink their rating down to that three to one ratio. Whereas now most of them have a five to one or six to one. So you've heard a lot of talk about the younger, healthier people subsidizing the older, sicker people. That's what's going on. Everybody's paying more, but the percentage of increases on the individual policies for the young people are astronomical. 50, 75, 80% increases. Oh, and one more thing about the family count on that slide. A lot of us are used to having coverage for single, couple, or family coverage. If you have one kid or six kids, the family price is the family price is the family price. Going forward, they are now doing family plus one, family plus two, family plus three. You are going to be rated for your oldest three children underneath the age of 20. So if you had a family of five kids underneath the age of 20, you're going to be rated for your first three. You get a free pass on the last two. But I have clients that have two kids in college, 21 and 23, and have three kids at home under 20. They now get rated as a family plus three for them and their three kids under 20. And each of the kids over 21 and, um, 21 and 23, each of those kids is going to carry a full single price tag. That promise a couple years ago that said you have your kid at over, uh, up to age 26, so you can come back on mom and dad's plan. And a lot of people did because if they were already paying the family rate, adding one more child onto that rate, cost no more money. Well, guess what? Now it does. So your employer plans, if you have an employer plan and your 22-year-old child is on that plan, when your employer plan renews in the year 2014, there are going to be some changes to your rates. I will almost guarantee it. Now let's get to the meat and potatoes the advanced premium tax credit. And I would think that this is probably the section that is the most confusing. This is the subsidy portion. This is where we try to figure out how much the federal government is going to give you to help you pay for your health care. Now, first and foremost, it is based on a future number. We are going to ask you what you think you are going to make in 2014. And I'm not lying. <laughs> so if let me rephrase this. It's based on your adjusted gross income for 2014. So a lot of my clients are going back to their past tax returns 2012, maybe taking a look at their line 37, which is your AGI, and just getting a rough estimate saying, well, nothing's really changed, so I can use that number going forward. That's fine. But what about the people like myself that work on 100% commission? I have really no idea what I'm going to make year to year, and there's a lot of people in the same boat. So we're really grasping for straws when it comes to guessing what your subsidy amount is. I find that this area would be a huge area for fraud because somebody making $100,000 could say that they make 20. It's all based on what you state. It's not verified the first year. It is verified when you file your taxes in April of 2015. They're going to know what you actually made in 2014, what you stated you think you were going to make, and they're going to do the math on whether they owe you money or whether you owe them. So if you didn't get all the subsidy that you were eligible for, they'll give you a little bit of money back. But if you get too much, they're going to take it back from you in taxes. Okay? To know whether or not you qualify for the subsidy, we have to use this chart. And I do have a full chart out there that goes up to a household size of eight. This I only use for four for the presentation purposes. When I talk about household size, I'm talking about tax filing status. So I met with a client last week that has a family of six, but their two oldest kids claim themselves. If the mom and dad wanted to look at their subsidy options, they are a household of four, not of six, even though the other two kids still live with them. Okay, it's how you file your taxes. Find your household size. Find your adjusted gross income. Okay. If you are off the chart to the right, if you're over 400%, there is no subsidy for you. There is absolutely zero reason to go to healthcare.gov and register and give them the information. 
You can buy a plan directly through the insurance carrier, Blue Cross, HAP, Health Plus, Priority, Humana, whoever you want. You do not have to go to healthcare.gov. Currently, the Medicaid level is 100% or lower. So if you find yourself at that 100% or lower amount, if you're not currently on Medicaid, you may want to call the Medicaid office to find out if you are eligible. And if you are not eligible, because income is not the only requirement to, to qualify for Medicaid, you may need to wait until April 1st when the Medicaid expansion takes place, where the income level now goes to 133%. So on April 1st, anybody making less than that 133% column will qualify for Medicaid. I don't have any more details than that. It's very vague. I know that the people that qualify for Medicaid do not qualify for a subsidy January, February, or March. So the very low income, somebody making $13,000 as a single person will qualify for Medicaid in April, but I can get them absolutely no help for the first three months. So are those people going to go uninsured? Or are they going to dip into any kind of savings if they have one to pay full price for a health plan for three months? Again, it just depends on the situation. And I will correct one thing. I know I put the MAGI in here, Modified Adjusted Gross Income. For most people, that's going to be your adjusted gross income. What the modified portion is, is it's your adjusted gross income plus any tax-exempt interest income. And the tax-exempt interest income is actually found on line 8B as in boy on your tax return. So if you wanted to look at a past tax return and just try to get an idea of what you're estimating uh, your income to be, it's line 37 plus line 8B as in boy. Okay. But again, for most people, it's just going to be your adjusted gross income. So if you find yourself between 133 and 400%, you qualify for a subsidy, right? Well, not guaranteed. Once you find yourself on this chart, your income level corresponds to a percentage, and it's a tiered percentage. And what they're going to do is they're going to take the second lowest cost silver plan that's available in your area and cap your premium at a percentage of your income. Okay? So, for, again, I'm a numbers person, so I like to put numbers to, to help explain this stuff. If you are a single person making $28,000 a year, you're at about 250% of the federal poverty level, plus or minus. Okay? I mean, I guess minus. That roughly corresponds to about an 8% cap. So if you take 8% times your $28,000, the most you would spend for a second lowest cost silver plan would be about $2,240 a year. That's about $186 a month. So you would have to spend $186 a month towards the second lowest cost silver plan before the federal government kicks in any subsidies. What does this mean? In Lapeer County, the second lowest cost silver plan happens to be a Blue Cross plan, and it's an HMO, a Blue Care Network plan. For a 25-year-old, the cost of the plan is $195. So if you're 25 years old and you make $28,000 a year, you have to spend $186, and then the federal government's going to pick up the rest. If the plan costs $195, you're going to get a $9 a month subsidy. Is going on to healthcare.gov worth it for $9 a month at that point? That's a question you have to ask. If you're 35 years old, that plan is $237. You only have to pay $186. So if you're 35 years old, you're getting about $51 a month. If you're 41, or I'm sorry, 45, it's $280 a month. Again, you have to spend $186, so the government's going to eat the other $94. So the older you are, the more subsidy you're going to get because the amount that you pay towards the plan is capped at this level, and the older you are, the plan costs more, but you don't have to pay it. So when we talk about the older people getting more subsidies, that's what we're talking about. Because a 21-year-old and a 64-year-old making $28,000 a year, both will have completely different subsidy situations. The 21-year-old will get very little, if any, and the 64-year-old will get the max. Now looking at a salary of $45,000 a year, a single person, they're at the very edge of that 400%. Well, hey, I make less than 400%, so I must qualify for a subsidy, right? Well, at $45,000, we know that their inc the amount of premium they have to pay is capped at 9.5% of their income. 9.5% of $45,000 is $4,275 a year, which is $356 a month. So if I'm a 25-year-old and I make forty-five dollars out of 
right out of college, and I think I qualify for a subsidy, I've got to pay the first $356 before I get a subsidy. If I'm 25, my plan only costs $195. No subsidy. If I'm 35, the plan costs 237 Still not 356 no subsidy. If I'm 45, 280 Still not 356 If I'm 55, the plan gets up to about 433 bucks. The 356 I spend, the federal government pays the difference, which is about $73. So when you just look at this, just because you qualify, think you qualify for a subsidy on the chart, you may not, based on your age and where that cap is for your income. I was going to save questions till the end, but if it's a quick one, go ahead. Very good question. Yes, once the amount that, of subsidy is determined, you can then take that money and buy whatever plan on the exchange you wish to purchase. So you have to go through healthcare.gov, unfortunately, but if you figure out that you are due $100 from the federal government to buy your plan, and you don't want that silver plan because it's an HMO, and it has a too high of a deductible, or whatever the reasons, you can buy a platinum plan if you want, and apply that $100 to it, you're gonna pay the difference. Same thing goes for the bronze plans. Maybe you're getting a subsidy that's enough to pay for that bronze level plan, and all you want is catastrophic coverage. Now you can get free coverage. You're never going to make money for it. If they give you $100 for a subsidy and the plan only costs $80, they're not going to give you a $20 check. They're just going to wipe out the 80 bucks. But that was a very good question. So it was also under our original understanding that in order to get this subsidy, okay, you had to go through the website, or you can go ahead and apply off the website, just buy a subsidized plan and do it at the end of the year with your accountant. You have to buy it through the website. So I have a big issue right now with a lot of my clients losing coverage on January 1st. We have to do something by December 15th, which they just pushed out till December 23rd. Thank you for the extra week. Doesn't really matter. So <laughs> I have to do something with them, and we're at a crossroads. They, I have a client that I talked to today that is getting $575 from the federal government to help him and his family pay for coverage, but we have to go through healthcare.gov, and he is scared to death to put his information on a website that's not secure. So he says, what are my options? pay full price. You can go to healthcare.gov and get your subsidy, or you can pay full price. I hope that last week the president did announce that they want to open up new avenues for people to purchase coverage. Healthcare.gov doesn't work, so how is it fair for these people that can't purchase coverage in time? Let us buy it directly from Blue Cross, directly from HAT, directly from Priority Health, and you guys figure out your subsidy. That is in the works, but I called Blue Cross just this morning and said, do you see the ability to write directly through Blue Cross by the end of the year and get a subsidy? And she just laughed. I mean, if you think about the me mechanics that are in the website that are already down, we're going to add to it another avenue for enrollment. It, it will come, but at some point in the future, who knows when that will be. So at this point in time, the only way to get your subsidy is to enroll in healthcare.gov. If you don't want to go to the website, then you're going to pay full price. Now the next slide is reduced cost sharing. This is the second kind of subsidy. The first subsidy I just talked about is advanced premium tax credit. Okay? And that money that we talk about, that 100 that 200 that $300 that the federal government's gonna give you on a monthly basis, they are sending that directly to the insurance company for you. You buy an $800 plan, you pay 400, they pay 400, you're made whole. Okay, and at the end of the year, that's when the IRS polices this. The second subsidy is this reduced cost sharing. If you find yourself in the income levels between 200 and 250, 150 and 200, or 100 and 150, you now get a different actuarial plan. So what that means, if we look at the 200 to 250%, you find yourself in that plan, you still have to buy that second lowest cost silver plan, or at least use that plan to base your subsidy on, right? You determine your subsidy, but because you're in that income level, you get a silver plan that has a 73% actuarial value. If we go back a couple slides, silver was 68 to 72. So you're actually able to get a slightly better silver plan than the average person. If you make between 150 and 200% of the poverty level, you actually get a silver plan that has 87% actuarial value. If we remember, platinum was 88 to 92. So now you're getting a plan that is almost a platinum plan. And again, you're still getting those subsidies. So you're paying the same premium as anybody else would for that plan, but you're getting, you're getting much better coverage. 
If you make between 100 and 150 percent, you get a 94 percent plan, which is better than anybody that any, anything anybody could buy on the marketplace. And I've seen a plan that looks like that. It's about $175 deductible with a $500 out of pocket. You get the $500, you're done paying, period. Now the trick about this subsidy, the funding for this subsidy, I know somebody mentioned earlier that Obamacare hadn't been funded yet, neither is this subsidy. The subsidy was part of the sequester, it has not been set aside. The White House is going to ask the insurance companies to eat this. Right. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. So I haven't seen anything on this subsidy from anybody but Blue Cross. And you would think that if HAP and Priority Health and Humana and these other carriers are on the marketplace, they would all have the same plan design. So again, this one I'm going to put on hold, but it is there. We just don't know if the money's there to fund it. Speaking of money to fund it, on to our next one. It's a new slide we added. Here's your taxes and fees. I won't go into detail about this. I do have a form out there, a flyer that talks about new taxes and fees, but I get asked every day, how are we paying for this? There's one way. So there's various tax and fees. They kick in at different levels. Some of them are affecting the small group market. Some of them are affecting the individual market. You can see the Medicare and Medicaid market, very little things that are being uh, you know, addressed there. It's primarily the individual and the fully insured group market, and typically the, the, the small group market. Now we talk about when we can enroll. There's this big push to get everybody enrolled by the 15th of the month for a January 1st start date. And the reason being is that the federal government has imposed new enrollment guidelines. In order to obtain coverage on the first of the month, you must apply in the first half of the month prior. So if you want coverage to start by January 1st, you have to apply before December 15th. Because if you apply on December 16th, your plan will now start February 1st. So they've kind of regulated the industry as far as when people can come on the plan and when people can come off the plan. Part of the reason for this was our fear from the beginning is when they pass a law that says you have to have coverage, but we're not going to ask you any medical questions, why would anybody buy health insurance until they absolutely have to have it? I get done doing this presentation, I just slip and fall and I break my leg, and then I call Blue Cross on my way to the hospital and say, hey, I need a plan. They did this, they put in these enrollment deadlines to keep people from jumping on and off the plan and buying it as plate insurance. I'm sure we're all familiar with the people that don't carry cover, car insurance, but they go buy that one month car insurance to go get their plates renewed and then drop their insurance. People would do the same thing if we didn't put these things and in place. And you think that you're going to avoid it by filling out a paper application or doing the 800 number? Sorry, it's all going back through healthcare.gov. That is the only mechanism for getting your subsidies. Okay? Now, to assist you with all this, you guys could figure it out yourself, the only plug I'm going to give myself and my industry, and again, it's not me, I would encourage you to contact your local trusted licensed insurance agent. The price is the price is the price. We only get paid if we sell a policy, and it doesn't come out of your pocket. It's a percentage of the premium. Okay? We are licensed people. We are not certified navigators that went through a 20-hour vigorous training course with no background checks. We have CE credits we have to satisfy every couple of years, and there are, a lot of, there are a lot of things that go into being a licensed agent. So I just encourage you to contact your local agent about the qu specific questions about your situation, or you can try to figure it out yourself. The individual mandate, as we talked about, everybody must have coverage or pay a penalty. And I don't even like calling it a penalty, I like calling it a tax, because we need to call it what it is. The Supreme Court said it's constitutional because it's a tax, so let's call it a tax. If you do not have health insurance, you're going to be taxed 1% of your income or $95, whichever is greater. Now, for most of you, if we can do math, $95, 1% means a salary of $9,500. That is underneath the Medicaid level, and Medicaid recipients do not have to pay the penalty. So I don't even like saying $95, let's just call it 1% of your income. If you do not have health insurance, you're going to pay 1% of your income as a tax. Next year it's going to go to 2%, the year after that it goes to 2.5%. Who knows what's going on in 2017. Uh, next slide we'll talk about, oh, is the Medicaid expansion. And again, with the state of Michigan, we did expand Medicaid. We talked about it going up to 133% as opposed to the 100% level that we uh, are currently at. 
each state had the opportunity to expand, and as you guys know, we did expand in the state of Michigan, but we did it late. We did it a quarter after the first of the year, so it does create a loophole. About 470,000 recipients are going to be added to the current enrollment levels for Medicaid, and it is supposed to be funded by the federal government. It will take effect April 1st, leaving a three-month gap for those coverage, uh, for those newly eligible. So the issue with that is, again, those people that may be eligible for some subsidies cannot get subsidies for January, February, March if they are Medicaid eligible. So you're either subsidy eligible or Medicaid eligible, not subsidy eligible, then Medicaid eligible. And the federal government is supposed to cover the full cost, gradually reducing the funding to 90% by 2021. Again, we don't have a lot of details on the Medicaid expansion. We are hoping that by mid-January they give us a summer lease because I have very little information to tell my customers, okay, so I make $12,000, now what? What do I do? Wait till April 1st, I guess. I, we really don't know. We don't know if we can get them a subsidy. I, again, there's so much uncertainty. What's to stop somebody who's Medicaid eligible saying that they make $20,000 a year? Now they're not Medicaid eligible, so January, February, and March they get their subsidy but then come April 1st, oh, guess what? I don't make 20,000, I only make 12. Give me Medicaid. What's to stop them from doing that? Are there checks and balances in place? We don't know. And that's what happens when we base subsidies on a future number that nobody knows what it can be. What's next? Small and large group miscellaneous talking points. Again, I know that we talk about the individual market a lot, but I just want to kind of hit on a couple things for those of you that have small group and um, employer coverage and large group employer coverage. Those of you that knew about the pay or play penalty for employer groups that had more than 50 employees, if you did not offer health coverage to your employees at a minimum value that was affordable, you got penalized up to $2,000 per employee that gets subsidized. Once somebody gets a subsidy, you're penalized $2,000 per full-time employee. Full-time is now 30 hours. All of this got pushed back a year. So the large companies are not forced to buy insurance until 2015 for their employees. A lot of companies I know already put the, me uh, the mechanics in place to prepare for this penalty. And by mechanics, I mean they lowered their part-time people down to 29 hours. They are an employer that has more than 50 employees. They know they're going to have to offer health coverage to anybody working 30 hours or more. So guess what we do? We eliminate the employees that are working 30 hours or more. Now nobody works more than 29. I have some good friends of mine that manage an Arby's, um, have a couple buddies that work at Burger King, things like that, that are on the management level. And they've had to go through and actually redo everybody's part-time hours where not one person gets more than 29 hours in any given week. They pushed this back a year. Do you think the employer went back and reinstated all their hours? Well, no, because they've already done the legwork. They've already spent the legal dollars to get this compliant, and they're going to be compliant next year when it actually is the law again. As a small group, it's defined as 2 to 49 employees. You do not have to offer coverage. If you offer coverage, it has to comply with the law, but you do not have to offer coverage. So there's a lot of misconception around there with my employer groups that have five employees that say, well, I have to offer it. You don't. If you do, it has to comply. Okay? And the big key about this is the third bullet point. If the small group employer offers you a plan that is at least a bronze level, so it meets at least some sort of minimum value, and it's affordable, which means that the employee-only contribution the amount of money that it will cost for a single employee, the amount of money that comes out of your paycheck, if it's less than 9.5% of your income, it is affordable. If your employer offers you, a single employee, coverage that's affordable and bronze, you do not qualify for a subsidy. Now, with that said, I have a lot of small employers that offer coverage to their employee only, but if their employee wants to add their spouse and their kids, they have to pick up the additional cost. If an employer offers coverage to the, the spouse and kids, but does not pay for it, he still offers it? If the individual's coverage is affordable and it meets that bronze level, there are no subsidies. So he cannot go get a subsidy for his wife and kids or for her husband and kids. So a lot of my small group employers may actually be locking their low income employees out of subsidy contention and not even know it. And for a lot of people, if you look at the difference between a single and a family plan, you could be upwards of maybe a $400 for a single and $1,200 a month for a family. It costs you $800 a month to add your husband and kids. Even if your employer is covering you at 100%, I can't afford to add $800 a month to my, for my 
spouse and children, I'm going to go out to the marketplace and find something for them. And I make $10 an hour. Well, guess what? You're paying full price because there's no subsidy for you because of what your employer is offering. So this comes into a lot of play when I meet with my small group employers and they decide, do I want to keep my group or do I want to go to individual? This is the math that we do. So when you talk about the mass exodus from the group market, this may, pay a play, this may play um, into that. Okay. Um, last page I have for you is just some um, resource pages. I think, did I have one more? Maybe, it, did it get deleted? Go one more slide, let's see if that one works. Ah, there we go. Apparently it's after questions. A couple, questions, or a couple resources there, healthcare.gov, we know that's the website you have to go to to apply. Again, only go to the website if you want a subsidy. I had a customer call me today and say, well, I have a large group employer plan through my husband, but I was just going to go to healthcare.gov and, and, and register. <laughs> no, there's no need for you to register, there's no need for you to give them that information, and there's no need for you to possibly have it floating around in cyberspace. HHS.gov and CMS.gov are two federal websites that you can go to. KFF.org. That is the subsidy calculator from the Kaiser Family Foundation. They are a nonprofit uh, health advocate. I love that site because that is, that is a very accurate subsidy calculator. So if you wanted to just go on and see, do I qualify for subsidy? That's the calculator we use nine times out of 10. On the home page is about a spot, about five or six things down that says healthcare uh, calculator or subsidy calculator. Click on it, you put in your county, your income, how many people are in your family on your taxes? How many people are you looking for coverage? Over 21 and under 20. Put in your ages, hit submit, and it's going to say, you make 388% of the federal poverty level. You have to pay 9.5% of your income, which is this is the amount you pay, this is the amount the government will pay, this is the amount of your total plan. So it's, again, it's an estimator. It's not accurate. You have to go to healthcare.gov if you want your subsidy, but it is a very good tool. And then healthcarereformbasics.com, that's a Blue Cross Blue Shield site. And again, I'm not advocating buying Blue Cross Blue Shield. They may or may not be your best option, but I do think they did a decent job with that website where it just kind of asks, so, uh, gives you some general information about uh, the Affordable Care Act. And then of course my information is there if anybody does want to um, pick my brain. So with that, I will close up and just kind of open it up to some questions. I've heard you mention that uh, big businesses may be getting rid of this and getting rid of that. I'll tell you that I uh, was a salary employee for General Motors, and three months ago I got a notification telling me that uh, as of January 1st, my family, my wife and family are no longer going to be covered under, under our insurance policy. So I don't think the questions may be anymore. I think they're going to do it. They, the biggest ones are already starting to do it. So, and then so when you start talking about how many people are not going to be insured, the fact is I'm still insured there, but if I have a family of six or seven, they are no longer insured there. Are they being counted, you think, in the count of all these people that are getting kicked off their policies? Absolutely. Absolutely, they're being counted. Um, and, and on that note, if the coverage that you have available to you is affordable and meets minimum value, then you can't go get a subsidy for your spouse and children if you were eligible for one. So you would end up at going to the marketplace and paying full, not, not the marketplace, but the market, and paying full price for a policy. And people, I think, ought to be aware of that because I don't think they are. Absolutely not. And I think that UPS made a big announcement about a month ago. They said they're dropping coverage for their spouses, and it made big news. And about two seconds later, FedEx said, we're not. So come work for us. Um, UPS did that, and I think they left out the fine details. They did it for people that their spouses had coverage available through their employer, but that didn't make the fine print. It was just UPS drops coverage for spouses. So there is a lot of misinformation about that, and I, do think it, I, I don't think people know what's going on, and I think it will be much more prevalent over the next uh, coming months as more and more companies figure out what's in this and as unaffordable as it is. Well, I'm trying to, I see on the uh, website, they say you can take pick up plans, but there's really just one plan, right? On the website? No. No. And I will be. I guess what I mean by plan is levels of coverage. I'm sorry. What was that? Levels of coverage. What a plan covers. I mean, it's mandated what has to be covered. So let's say there's ten things, just for argument. Is 
Are they all the same or are they different plans? They are or? all different plans. And this sheet, I 100% honestly, I have still not made it to the plans page on healthcare.gov. We as an agency got our first one through yesterday morning. There are three steps on healthcare.gov. You create an account. Once your account's created, you log in with that username and password and you complete your personal information. And then step three is picking a plan. I've gotten three people successful to the end of um, step two, but I've still not seen the plans. This list I have here is from the Department of Financial and Insurance Services for the state of Michigan. These are the approved plans. And just in the silver market, to let, give you an idea, there's five, seven, 10, 14, 19 plans, just in silver. So when you log in there on the marketplace for Lapeer, you're probably going to see, I'm guessing with bronze, gold, and platinum, probably about 50 plans. And all silver plans are supposed to be somewhat similar. But we have silver plans with a $1,400 deductible and we have silver plans with a $5,000 deductible. So it is really all over the board. It depends on where that out-of-pocket maximum is. Okay. But yeah, there's not just one plan. And on that note, there is no such thing as an Obamacare plan. I have some of my customers, just, or customers call me and say, I want that Obamacare plan. Obamacare is the law that all the plans must follow. <laughs> Every plan is essentially an Obamacare plan if it follows the rules. I hope that answered your question about the plan choices. <laughs> That's my job. Um, it says the federal poverty level. What is the federal poverty level amount? It, the 100% column, that's what they're basing it on. So I believe right now it's about 11,000 and some change. And that is adjusted annually for inflation. So these are actually the 2013 federal poverty charts, which is what we're using, um, which is what the government is using for this. But that is the federal poverty level. So then what they did is uh, um, they said, okay, four times the federal poverty level, we're gonna allow subsidies, which is where the 400% comes into play. So right now for a single person, it's $11,490. And for four family of four, it's 23,550. Now just because you make that amount does not necessarily mean you will qualify for Medicaid. There are other factors that go in, such as assets and dependents, but I believe the assets and dependents has been removed for April 1st. So the single people right now with no children making $10,000 do not qualify for Medicaid, but our understanding is as of April 1st, they will. The same thing with that person that says, well, I don't have a job in 2014, so my income is zero, but I've got a million dollars in assets sitting over here. Are they still gonna be able to qualify for Medicaid? We think they are because they're not checking assets. So again, I, believe, I do believe that there are many opportunities for abuse in the system as, as there is with any kind of large government program like this. I don't believe the checks and balances have been, been put, put in place yet. Yes, uh, I'm a senior. I've got Medicare and I've got the Health Plus uh, Gap Advantage program. And am I gonna be safe? I've made a selection this year for next year. How safe am I? You're 100% safe for now. Um, the plans are not directly affected by this um, Obamacare, Affordable Care Act. The Medicare Advantage plans, the internal mechanisms, do not comply with these essential health benefits. They're not adding maternity coverage onto the Medicare plans, okay? But what is going to affect the Medicare plans is the adverse or the behind the scenes lack of funding. If they pull $500 million from the Medicare program to pay for this thing, then you're gonna see your Medicare Advantage plans and your Medicare Supplement plans, you're gonna see your prices go up, you're going to see your co-pays go up, and you're going to see your benefits go down. We and don't know how that's going to turn out? We did see with uh, Health Plus this year specifically, they took a little bit of hit on their PPO plan, um, larger than they have in the past. So as far as how it pans out, we have absolutely no idea. I have a hard time predicting two weeks from now, let alone two years from now. And that's, it, just, it is what it is. Uh, just a, a couple of questions. Now, I understand that uh, next year, about this time in late summer or fall, as, as the it affects uh, uh, small and mid-sized businesses, it's supposed to affect, um, I mean, lots and lots of people. And that, the, the, what we're going through now, I, I'm a small business person. I actually was renewing my, our, uh, our business insurance and was mentioning to the gal, at, you know, the, it's, they do insurance as well. And she'd actually just lost her, her coverage. So she was actually, she's an insurance person like yourself. She is now having to go through and get her own insurance on her, which I was just was really ironic. But um, my, the thing about the Medicaid expansion, and I've talked this to a number of different legislators, 
this is all contingent on waivers and whether or not the state of Michigan, because they put, they were so, they were trying to cover their, their backsides on, you know, both sides. There are so many waivers in there, they don't know if and when that's going to get approved. So this could all throw, I mean, it should, it, it's got potential for derailing the whole thing. Is, is that correct? Yes. Simple answer. Um, yes, we, we still don't, the Medicaid has been approved, but we still don't have the final stamp yet. So I, I really don't, yes. Uh, there's something about the people over 70 that the death benefit, or death, death panels that uh, Sarah Palin has been talking about. I'm curious about that because with all the benefits given to the people or the subsidies of the older people, I can see that they would want to use the death panels to cut that out. What you're referring to would be, I mean, yes, there are the death panels that we talk about. Are they really in existence? I don't know. I think that they are in existence to a, to a point. Um, I use examples. And in Canada, for example, under their national health care system, if you're a 75-year-old male and you are diagnosed with prostate cancer, you have prostate cancer. Your average life expectancy is about 83. Prostate cancer takes anywhere from 8 to 10 years to kill you. So why fix you if you're going to make it to your life expectancy anyways? That's kind of the same lines that's coming down the road. If the government does have this panel that oversees these type of life-ending procedures or decisions, then yes, you could essentially have a situation where you want the care, but you're not going to get it based on your age. Specifics about it, I really don't know, but we do know that it is hidden in there as far as there's a board of, of panelists that are going to approve certain procedures at some point in your life. Again, where that is in the making, I have absolutely no idea. At this point in time, I don't see it, but we don't know. But it's obviously a big concern. And we always talk about other countries that are struggling under their um, socialized medical system, and yet we're striving to be like them. If everybody else is trying to get out from under it, why are we trying to recreate the wheel and go underneath it? It just doesn't make any sense. The Dems always say, look at Massachusetts and how well it's working there. <laughs> What's wrong with that statement? Lots. <laughs> where, where do we start? Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 there's lots of issues. I don't think it's modeled exactly after Mass Massachusetts. I'm sure Massachusetts had its success levels, but they also had their failures. And, you know, the federal government set out to do this. They were anticipating that they were going to have three to five states that they were going to actually have to run. Because as you guys know, history lessons tell us, the states never really want to relinquish power to the federal government. There's always this power struggle, and hey, let us handle it on a state level. It's about the first time in history that you've seen 36 states jump on board and say, eh, you guys handle it. We're passing the buck. So the federal government's trying to model this after Massachusetts, but they're trying to do it on a 36 times scale, which there's really no comparison. Yes. Um, if you don't buy your insurance through the healthcare.gov or whatever it is, how, how do they know, the government know, that you have insurance or not? Very good question. We are making an assumption that at the end of the year, your insurance company is going to provide you with some sort of form that you're going to have for taxes. That's probably another piece of paper that you either need to turn into TurboTax or turn into your accountant to handle. Um, because any health insurance plan that you have, as long as it meets the essential benefit level at some point in 2014, is a qualified plan. So all the plans that I have currently with my customers that are actually extended into 2014, because a lot of carriers filed the rates and said, listen, we're going to extend our rates into December 1st of 2014. They don't have to jump onto these compliant plans until it renews. Upon renewal is when they're going to have to face the, face the music on that. So we are assuming that if you have an older plan, the health insurance companies are still going to have to somehow notify the IRS that you had this plan all the way through December 1st, and then you jumped onto the Obamacare compliant plan. So whether you buy it through the exchange or whether you don't, I believe something's going to come from the insurance carrier themselves proving that you had coverage. But that's a very good question. You're going to have to prove coverage somehow, and how do we do that? Do you show them a deck page? Do you show them an application? Or do you show them a form the, federal, the, the insurance company is going to produce? And I'm assuming that's the latter. 
there's a lot of assumptions that we have to make in this industry. And for three and a half years, I've lived on assumptions, and I was really actually looking forward to October 1st so that we can finally get this thing started and say, okay, what does it actually mean so I can educate my customers? And I'm more confused now after the last two months than I was before October 1st ever started. Because the more and more we see, the more and more questions we ask that were apparently never raised because when we ask them, people go, huh? What do you mean? Well, maybe if you would have asked people in the industry or people in the business world that understand and how to operate these plans, you know, maybe we could have eliminated some of these issues. Hey, Micah, um, my head's spinning here a little bit. Um, the, with the number of clients that you have, I have to assume you have some of them who have lost their coverage or been notified they've lost. What are, what's going to happen? We can't recover that quickly enough, am I right? When you say recover. As, well, get them coverage. I have um, three weeks and counting. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really a mass outreach. There's, there's people that may be left in a gap. People may just be so fed up with this that they just say, you know what, I'm going to pay the 1% penalty right. for the first month or two because it is going to be prorated. And maybe I'll just wait till February. Maybe I'll wait till March 31st, the last day I have to sign up. Maybe they'll get the glitches worked out. Maybe they'll get the security up and running. We don't know. But no, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, they've really backed us up against the wall. On October 1st, I had a lot of people to help. And now it's December 2nd, and I haven't been able to help any of them, and all they've been doing is piling up in a pile. I have four stacks of files in my office, and they are losing coverage, need subsidy, losing coverage, no subsidy, not losing coverage, need subsidy, and not losing coverage, no subsidy. And so it's kind of prioritizing, saying these people need help right now because they're losing coverage. These people have coverage, they're just shopping. Yeah. I'll help you, but these people need help right this second. So it's created a sense of urgency in our industry, and our backs are against the wall. Well, I am, some of these people are sick. Oh, I have a, a gentleman that's going for cancer treatment January 7th down in Texas. First of all, we have to find him a new plan. We have to make sure that the doctor, the clinic down in Texas is in his network. And we're, we're walking in uncharted territory. And this is a gentleman that qualifies for about $300 a month in subsidy, but he's so fed up with the federal government website that he's ready to pay $900 a month for a plan that limits his out-of-pocket costs to a low amount because he knows he's going to cap out his plan. So he's going to buy a $900 a month with no subsidy, a $900 a month plan just for peace of mind that he knows he has something for January 1st. Is that fair to him? Absolutely not. And of course, this law was put into place to help people with chronic illnesses and issues so that they didn't file bankruptcy for medical bills. The best Blue Cross plan that is on the market for my family of four and for your family of four has a $300 common deductible that the whole family has to satisfy, one or all four people. After 300 bucks, you could have $9,900 out of pocket at the 80-20 level. So you could have $10,200 out of pocket if only one person gets hospitalized. For my family of four, if I make $95,000, I'm all over the poverty level, or over the 400%, so I get no subsidy. That plan costs me $1,050 a month. So I'm gonna spend $1,050 a month, and if one of us spends a week in the hospital, we're gonna also pay $10,200. If I make 95 grand, that's about $23,000 cash out of my pocket. And the 95 grand I made, I take home about 70. You're spending one third of your, your you know, liquid assets, your money, on medical costs. This was supposed to help people not file bankruptcy because of medical bills. So it's, there's, I, I use the term affordable as a relative term. I really don't think there's anything affordable about the Affordable Care Act because the prices are still high. It may seem affordable to you because the federal government's paying a portion of your premium, but the premium is still here. The premium is still not affordable. It may be affordable to you because somebody else is picking up the tab, a, a, you know, i.e. taxpayers, but it's still not affordable. So this did nothing to drive down the cost of health care. And I typically, with these seminars, I typically don't get this involved. With it. I kind of stay neutral. But I kind of know where we're all on the same page as far as where this law is. And it's really, it's really disturbing when you see what I see in this, this plan. I have, my father-in-law is one of the principals of our firm, just to give you a little background. And I have ownership, I'm in the buy-sell agreement, and I was this close to leaving seven months ago. Not because I hate my father-in-law, not because I hate my company, but because I'm fearful for my future with this law, because I really do think that over time, as you guys all probably feel, that this thing is not going to work, and what's gonna happen then, and is this really a Trojan horse for single payer? What are we gonna do if this thing fails? Go back to the old system? No. So what's our next step? We don't know, and we don't have anybody giving us answers. There's a, couple, there's a couple conservative leaders that have some decent ideas, HSAs when you're born and things like that, and I don't disagree with those. Will they ever fly? I doubt it, because there's no such thing as personal accountability in our country. 
Nee, was net. Ja, ja. So I think, I think my time is probably overdue. I apologize for taking up your guys' time. I know it's getting late. So I really do appreciate the opportunity. I'll stick around afterwards for anybody else who has questions. Well, thank you very much, Micah. That was very informative, and um, I feel a little bit more educated about the topic now. So um, we're going to end this evening, and uh, we'll come back in January. So is everybody ready for 2014? 2014 is going to be a big year for us. It's going to be big. Yeah. I expect we'll see some of the same victories we saw in, um, earlier in 2010, and uh, I ex I'm excited about that. So it's going to take a lot of um, effort, though. So will you stand with me? We're going to close with prayer. Um, this was taken from a collection of prayers written by veterans that were part of the Parachute Regiment and Airborne Forces, um, the 11th Airborne, and it's a beautiful prayer. May the defense of the Most High be above and beneath, around and within us, in our going out and in our coming in, in our rising up and in our going down, through all our days and all our nights, until the dawn when the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings for the peoples of the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Good night. Yes. We have a business meeting on December 12th at 7 p.m. at the Lapeer Sportsman's Club.